Today in the show, we have the House of Mouse headlines brought to you by LaughingPlace.com, your up-to-date resource for the latest Disney news every day of the week. This episode is being released on May 17th, 2023, and here's what's been going on in the world of Disney recently. Lots of changes coming to Walt Disney World's guest experience next year, Hulu finally joining Disney+, Plus. another Guardian comes to Avengers Campus, and more. Hear the latest news from the Walt Disney Company in today's House of Mouse headlines. With Disneyland Paris's well-reviewed nighttime spectacular Avengers Power the Night ending its run on May 8th, the resort has already announced plans for a revival. The show will return to Walt Disney Studios Park from September 1st through November 5th. This second run will give fans another chance to witness this jaw-dropping show that combines projections, pyrotechnics, and 500 drones to bring the Marvel Universe to life in the sky. So if you're planning a trip to Disneyland Paris this fall, be sure to catch Avengers Power the Night before its real endgame. Another new installment into the Marvel Cinematic Universe means another new character has come to Avengers Campus at Disney California Adventure. This time, it's Guardians of the Galaxy's Mantis who has made her park debut, appearing alongside Star-Lord in the awesome dance-off show that takes place in front of Mission Breakout. The show has been updated due to her appearance, as it previously featured Gamora. But don't fret too much, Gamora fans, as it seems that she still appears as a meet-and-greet character outside of the show. You can catch Guardians of the Galaxy Awesome Dance-Off at DCA and see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in theaters now. Believe it or not, the 2023 Epcot International Food and Wine Festival is nearly two months away. Ahead of the popular event's return, Disney has announced the lineup for this year's Eat to the Beat concert series. Some newcomers include Orienthi for King and Country, Ruben Stuttered with Haley Reinhart, The Bacon Brothers, Philip Phillips, and more. Meanwhile, some returning favorites include Boys to Men, Joey Fatone from NSYNC, the greatest boy band of all time, and Friends, 98 Degrees, Sugar Ray, Hanson, and many others. Eat to the Beat performances will be held Fridays through Mondays between July 27th and November 13th, with set times at 5.30, 6.45, and 8 p.m. For the full lineup and more information on this year's festival, be sure to check out WaltDisneyWorld.com. Walt Disney World has announced a brand new restaurant coming to Epcot. Now, apologies in advance for the messy pronunciations here, but I'll do my best. Located in the Japan Pavilion, Shiki Sai Sushi Izakaya promises a festive dining experience in a shareable Izakaya style. Additionally, the location will embrace the festivals of Japan both in its decor and its seasonal items. In addition to a full menu filled with mouth-watering Japanese delights, there will be an open sushi bar and grill. It looks as though Shikisai Sushi Izakaya will be taking over the Tokyo dining spot on the second floor of the pavilion, next to Teppan Ido and above Takumi Tai. The new location is expected to open this summer at Epcot. Disney Imagineer Daniel Joseph is among the list of 2023 class of inductees into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Joseph has been an inventor his whole life and holds more than 30 Disney patents. As a principal illusion integrator, he helps imagine, design, and install all sorts of special effects and illusions for Disney experiences around the globe, including the beloved Hatbox Ghost in the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland Park and soon to be at the Haunted Mansion at Walt Disney World. Congratulations to Daniel Joseph on this great honor. During a Disney earnings call last week, CEO Bob Iger was, of course, asked about the company's lawsuit with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. In response to the question, Iger again explained that he thought the governor's action amounted to retaliation. He also noted that there are more than 2,000 special districts in Florida akin to Reedy Creek Improvement District, and Disney is the largest taxpayer in Central Florida, paying over $1.1 billion in state and local taxes last year. Iger went on to mention that the company did plan to invest $17 billion in Florida over the next 10 years, but asked, does the state want us to invest more, employ more people, and pay more taxes or not? As I said last time, stay tuned. 
Disney on Ice has announced a brand new show. What's more, it is set to feature the most Disney characters in one show, with a count totaling 56. Plus, the production will also include the on-ice debut of Frozen 2 and Raya and the Last Dragon. Chart a course through the night sky to Disney on Ice, where every story begins with a wish. Through cutting-edge figure skating, high-flying acrobatics, unexpected stunts, innovative lighting, thrilling special effects eye-catching costumes, and stunning set designs, this all-new production brings the brightest Disney stars to life. Not only will Mickey and friends make appearances, but guests will also see characters from The Princess and the Frog, Cinderella, Snow White, Aladdin, Tangled, Toy Story, and many more. And yes, guests will travel to the mountains of Colombia where the Madrigal family lives and find out why we don't talk about Bruno. Tickets are now available for this latest tour, and you can find more info at DisneyOnIce.com. 20 years later, a sequel to the hit 2003 film Freaky Friday is apparently in the works at Disney with Lindsay Lohan and Academy Award winner Jamie Lee Curtis set to reprise their roles. While this isn't the first we've heard about such a project, with Curtis mentioning her desire for a sequel while doing press for Halloween Ends last year, it seems things have progressed a bit as Elise Hollander has been hired to write the script for the film. Of course, with the Writers Guild of America strike currently underway, we probably won't have many other updates for a while, but perhaps we'll learn more about the potential plot and other details down the road. Ahead of the release of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the classic Raiders of the Lost Ark is returning to theaters. Unlike some other recent re-releases, this one will actually be a Fathom event, with screenings taking place at select cinemas on Sunday, June 4th and Wednesday, June 7th. To find showings near you, you can visit fathomevents.com or visit your local theater. Meanwhile, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny swings into theaters on June 30th. After one season of being exclusive to Disney+, Dancing with the Stars is returning to ABC for season 32. However, the ballroom dance competition will continue to be simulcast live on Disney+, and be available to stream the next day on Hulu. As previously announced, the upcoming season will find Julianne Huff joining Alfonso Ribera as co-host, following the departure of Tyra Banks from the role. It's probably not a coincidence that this news came just as the writer's strike was getting underway, but there's no way to know for sure how much of an impact that had on the decision. In any case, you can catch season 32 of Dancing with the Stars on the Alphabet Network and Disney Plus this fall. And now it's time to bring in Kyle Burbank from LaughingPlace.com. Hello, Kyle. Hello, Jeff. I was just saying to you, I feel like this was like a month ago since we last spoke, but I guess there is recorded proof that it was only two <laughs> weeks ago. Yeah, you know, time time is strange sometimes. As I will always say, time is weird. I should just get that tattooed on my body because I say that far more often than I wish I, I needed to, but time is weird. Hashtag, hashtag, time is weird. See, if you were DeFranco, to bring it back to the topic we always come to, you would turn that into a piece of merch. I would. You're right. Uh, he needs to start making, like, you know, name branded stuff again. I'm sick of s random slogans being his merch. But in any case, I digress. Let's jump into the Disney news. We got some interesting Disney streaming news as well as Disney parks kind of going way back to the way they used to be news. So let's jump in first with Disney will begin offering a one app experience that will include Hulu within Disney+. Plus. Probably not too shocking to too many people, but this offering will roll out in the United States by the end of the calendar year. Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus will continue to be offered as standalone options when this rolls out. This comes as Disney looks to increase integrating marketing across the company. So yeah, I mean, this is happening. I guess that means Hulu is not dissolving, which was kind of a possibility, uh, we thought. Well, we don't know if it is yet. They they don't own it all. They still have to negotiate with Comcast. And, and this is kind of um, tipping their hand, <laughs> seeing that it does seem to indicate that they do plan on buying it, which is not great from a negotiation standpoint to be like, hey, we really want this thing. Uh, please give it to us at a fair price. This is obviously like overdue. Like it makes sense. There's already Star in Europe and other places. It makes sense to have a Hulu thing. But Knowing Disney tech the way I do, I'm not looking forward to this because – so in my situation, I have Hulu through Spotify from whatever deal they had forever ago. I have ad-supported Hulu 
and then I have um, ad free Disney Plus. So even that alone, like even if they were on the same account, but just, di- you know, different, not technically a bundle, I would imagine that my uh, no ad Disney Plus would not be smart enough to run ad during Hulu. And so it probably just wouldn't be okay. But the fact that I have two different email addresses, I'm sure is a, is a deal breaker. So I imagine you have to have like a certain bundle to get this to work. That's just what I'm imagining. They haven't said anything. They just teased this functionality, but I'm already kind of uh, dreading the fact that it's that I imagine I'll be a loophole somewhere. Yeah, that's the problem with all of this stuff when everybody buys everybody and merges with everybody. Like there's always – it's never cut and dry. And that unfortunately is just the entertainment industry these days. Like everything is just so confusing. Like I can't even keep track of who owns what anymore. It's it's bonkers. But um, yeah, I mean we'll see what happens. Uh, Hulu and Disney Plus are two very different things. But yeah, if Disney, especially if Disney ends up owning Hulu 100%, uh, here's the deal they should make. They should be like, Universal, just, you know, sell it to us, re- d- decent price. We'll let you keep Marvel in your theme park for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if they have a choice there, isn't it? Exactly. Universal will be like, um, you're not giving us anything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the... I don't know. This is it's interesting. The, Disney is clearly trying to figure out how to make more money with streaming. There, there's a there's a streaming problem, and we knew this was going to come, right? Like everybody had a streaming service. Every little thing has their own streaming service now. I'm dreading the same thing with HBO Max or what do they call it now? Just Max. Just Max. Which <laughs> I, I like this. You could have. I'm Disney Plus. I'm Paramount Plus, and I'm Max. <laughs> Yeah, HBO Plus was sick, so the union sent me. <laughs> well, I, I'm dreading the day that Max and uh, and Discovery Plus have to merge, because Discovery now owns uh, Warner Brothers, which owns HBO, which owns Max, and all that stuff. I enjoy my very inexpensive Discovery Plus. I don't want to pay for the Max. So, in any case, uh, it's all very confusing. But it's happening. Let's move on from there, because there's even more streaming stuff. During the quarterly earnings call, CFO Christine McCarthy announced the plan to eventually remove content from their platforms. She says, quote, We're in the process of reviewing the content on our direct-to-consumer services to align with the strategic changes in our approach to content curation. As a result, we will be removing certain content from our streaming platforms and currently expect to take an impairment charge of approximately 1.5 to 1.8 billion dollars the charge which will not be recorded in our segment results will primarily be recognized in the third quarter as we complete our review and remove the content end quote we have no info as far as like what content's being removed or anything like that presumably originals you what say you think the originals i would think so because otherwise there's not an impairment cost i think that's a say, essentially saying it's a, a write down so if it's stuff that they already own there's putting up their I don't know how much of a cost that is, but if it's the original stuff, they're like, hey, this didn't make any money, so we're going to – we took a loss of this much. That's why I think it would be originals. It could be con- library content. Like, I'm sure there's still deals in place with somebody, but, you know, as we as we can see uh, from the WGA strike, a lot of these deals aren't meant to deal with uh, streaming as far as residuals and stuff, so I don't know how much – people like i don't know how much library content would really cost them to host i just assumed that this would have been stuff that they were paying for and they'd be getting rid of that i don't understand how they save money unless it's like a back-end tax thing with stuff that they've already paid it's a tax thing well Well, i don't know for sure but i'm saying like that's what a write-off is or you know you say you lost this much and then you don't pay taxes on that much that's that's a terrible reason to get rid of stuff that you've already paid to create i that's that's actually infuriating if that's what they're I, I was doing. Surprised. Yeah, I was waiting for the physical media thing. I mean, I, I don't know exactly what this means. It is weird that if they're meant to save money, why they say they'd face a cost. But, I mean, between – this is basically what – we're just talking about HBO Max. That's kind of what they – how they got uh, on people's bad sides. They just started removing stuff and um, saying, hey, it's better just to take the take a write-off on it than to put it out there or have it out there. So now we're entering like a new age of lost media where, you know, these shows were made, they screen for a little bit, and they're never going to be anywhere. 
Yeah, it's not like in the old days it was because of deterioration. Film literally deteriorated before it was replicated and therefore lost forever. These days, it's it's just not available anywhere. Uh, eventually, the technology of the digital version of it will be unavailable because it, like the way we had floppy disks, how the hell do you read a floppy disk these days? We're just going to lose this stuff. This is insane to me. Once again, the fight for physical media continues. If you love something and it's on physical media, buy it. Buy it in every updated version that becomes available, because one of these days it will be gone. What if High School Musical, the musical, the series can never be seen again, Kyle? That's brutal out there. This is where... I wish that there were like real people on these earnings calls instead of just investors who are going to ask their two. It always says, please ask one question. They ask two questions. But I want to know or like just convey to them, be like, hey, you know, Netflix does a pretty decent job of being like, here's what's coming this month. Here's what's going this month. So at least I hope that they don't just pull an HBO Max and pull the stuff down without telling you what's going away. I hope that they give people at least a heads up. But apparently, like, Tomorrowland disappeared off of Disney+. Plus. That's weird. Uh, that was a while ago. I mean, they made such a big deal at the beginning about how Disney+, Plus would have everything. And then they're like, wait, well, not everything. Not, not the movie you're thinking of. So to start, you know, backtracking on that is... Yeah, it, at this point, you know, we wondered whether Igro would be hurting his legacy. And it's like, yeah, you know what? Disney+, Plus was, he, he left at the top. He's like, I look like a genius. There's a pandemic. Everyone's sitting at home watching Disney+. Plus, and now he's like, yeah, uh, maybe this wasn't <laughs> the best uh, way forward. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But speaking of weird streaming stuff going on, so I, um, as we've talked about, huge fan of Superstore. And I was watching it on Peacock. And one day I noticed it said, like, leaving April 30th. And I was like, oh, where's it going to go? So I check and I'm like, oh, it's going to Hulu. So I start watching it over on Hulu, you know, just because I watch that show regularly. And then I discovered something last night. It's still on Peacock as well. So it's like currently on Peacock and Hulu, even though Peacock had said it was leaving. So like, I'm very confused. That is confusing. I will say um, some some late breaking news that came out today that didn't make it into the script. Um, Avatar is coming. Avatar The Way of Water is coming to Disney Plus, I think, June 7th. And because of the legacy 20th century deal, it will also be on Max. So wow. that's another example of it being on a couple different services. And also, while we're talking about sitcoms we watch often, Community is on Hulu and it's also on Netflix. But the version that they have on Netflix, the um, pilot is the aired version and the Hulu version is the extended one. So there's actually two different versions of the pilot that you can watch. I hate this industry. Oh, my God. <laughs> it is so stupid. Whoa, gosh. That, nothing is simple anymore. It's like, okay, now that we're going on this whole entertainment industry rant sort of thing, you want to know something that drives me crazy? Have you seen these beautiful ads that Warner Brothers has put out celebrating their 100th anniversary this year? I haven't, but I know that they are celebrating. The, it's a big year for Burbank, I think, as we said. It is, and uh, is, and Kyle Burbank as well, just because why not? Um, but they they have the, they made a beautiful little montage of you know an overhead shot of the lot and zooming in on the water tower, and they show clips of films on the water tower. And the first clip they show, what film do you think it is, Kyle? What Warner Brothers movie do you think they show first? I don't know. It's The Wizard of Oz. Who made The Wizard of Oz? MGM made The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, MGM made The Wizard of Oz, and I get it. Warner Brothers owns it. They've owned it as part of the library for a very long time when they bought the library, I think, from Turner, who owned the MGM library. But I'm just like, really? You're going to celebrate your 100th, and the first thing you're going to show is a movie that your studio didn't even make. You simply acquired it. That's insanity to me. <laughs> well, at least they didn't uh, just show a clip from Little Mermaid during the Oscars. No, you know what? I accept that more. 
than the WB100 ad. That was a terrible choice. Anyway, let's move on because, you know, uh, there's more stuff. Disney Plus has lost 4 million overall subscribers in the company's fiscal second quarter after losing 2.4 million subscribers in quarter one. 4.6 million of those were from Disney Plus Hotstar, which is uh, the overseas version. It's the specifically s- Southeast Asia, like um, India. Um, it's much cheaper um, way lower and this was also expected because they gave up on bidding for the super expensive cricket rights and then the domestic subscriptions also fell by 300,000 now the company has 231.3 million total streaming subscriptions which includes disney plus disney plus hotstar hulu and espn plus i thought they said they were going to stop reporting those numbers of subscribers that's what i thought i asked benji the same thing i think they what he said was, like, oh, maybe they meant they're going to stop giving guidance, like where they think it's going. Because remember, during the last Disney Plus Investor Day, they gave updated numbers saying, we think we're going to hit this number by the end of 2024. So rather than say, hey, we're hitting the, rather than making the subscriptions the target, they're saying we're focusing on the profitability half of that instead. So yeah, I had the same issue as you. I thought they weren't providing the numbers at all. All right. Well, there are a total of 57.8 million subscribers now between Disney Plus and Disney Plus Hotstar. Despite the drop in subscribers, the revenue Disney has made from each subscriber has increased. Domestically, it rose 20% from $5.95 per subscriber to $7.14 per subscriber. And Iger indicated that Disney is planning to widen the price gap between the ad-supported and ad-free tiers of Disney+, Plus, which I assume means the ad su- or the ad-free version is just going to go up in price. I hope they're not stupid est- enough to raise the price of the ad version because I feel like those are the people who are on the fence right now, right? Like it's right. You know, it's those are the people that I feel like would drop it first. It's the diehard. He didn't say either way, um, but I think he he kind of listening to the call. He didn't rule out the you know they might raise that one by a little bit and raise the other one by a lot, but he definitely said yeah we want to increase. We want people basically they want to make the ad supported one the choice because they. Even though it costs less, they make more because the ad people want to run their ads in Disney+. Plus. And interrupt movies. Okay, cool. Uh, this is expected to increase by the end of the year, and there will be an ad-supported tier of Disney Plus in Europe launching later this year. So, listen, lots of changes coming to streaming. It's interesting to say, not only with Disney+, Plus, like, just as a whole, the industry of streaming... It's really interesting. Not all of this is going to survive. It's going to be interesting to see what dies. I don't think Disney Plus is going to die, but I think they got some stuff to figure out. Yeah. Uh, and I do just want to kind of hit on those some of those points. Again, last quarter was the first time Disney Plus had ever lost subscribers, and those were all Hotstar in the U.S. and Canada. They actually increased. So this is actually the first time that they've lost subscribers in the U.S. and Canada, but 300,000 even with a pretty significant price increase and a change in model, is really not that bad. It's really that four point. So if you're wondering how this math adds up, by the way, four point six from Disney Plus Hotstar lost minus three hundred thousand in the U.S. and Canada, but then the other international markets gained. So that's how it gets back up to four million lost for the quarter. So you know, th- there's definitely issues, but at the same time, like you, you twenty up the revenues. So in the U.S. and Canada, they lost 1% of subscribers and gained 20% revenue. So they're not hurting too, too bad. <laughs> yeah, this is something that you see in Broadway all the time where like every year. You can year, make more with a flop than a hit? Oh. <laughs> you can make more money with a flop than with a hit. We can do it. We can do it. Anybody who knows that, write into the show. Give a call. Let us know. Anyway, um, no, you see this with Broadway every year where it feels like every year there's a new record broken for a show that made more money than before. And, and you know, it's like, well, they're not adding seats to theaters. They're simply charging more and therefore making it less accessible to people. So, like, yeah, listen, it, it's good when things become more profitable for these companies. I get it. But it's bad when it gets to a point of, like, you're losing people along the way. Like, I don't know. I, I would rather entertain more people and make a little less money. As long as it's profitable and highly profitable, we're, we're talking, by the way. I don't think it's to be celebrated when you're like, well, we made a crap ton more money. 
Not if not if you're losing pe- numbers of people, in my opinion. But who am I, right? Not a businessman. That's who. <laughs> Apparently not. Alrighty. Well, at least a businessman who has a little bit of a heart, unlike you know some of these folks. Anyway, let's move on because Disney Parks news. We got some news that's kind of like rewinding time. A little pre-pandemic news here, <laughs> which is nice because the Disney Quick Service Dining Plan and the Disney Dining Plan will once again be offered next year. This will begin with vacation packages for stays starting January 9th, 2024. These new vacation packages will be available for booking beginning May 31st, 2023. With these options, guests will be able to enjoy the convenience and peace of mind for of prepaying for their meals and snacks. While pricing for these plans won't be announced until the 31st, Disney notes that guests will save up to 20% on dining for kids ages 3 to 9 when they purchase a dining plan for their family as part of a package. I never did this. Did you? I never have either because I usually don't stay on property. I'm not fancy enough like that. I always just had cast member friends that I'd stay on their couch. But I do. I I like that you could save 20% on kids meals between three and nine. It's very specific uh, savings. I imagine that the prepaying is really what you're doing. Yeah, it's interesting. The what adults will save, I imagine less or else they would have touted that as well. Here's the thing that's very smart about this is it basically guarantees you're going to be spending food money at Disney, right? Like, whereas when I go and granted, there are a lot of people who go to Disney property, never leave it and and eat every meal there. But like, you know, going as often as we get to, it's like, nah, I want to leave property tonight and eat at a local restaurant or I want to go to Universal and eat at City Walk or something. And basically, if you've prepaid for this, you're not going to do that. So it is a very smart business move uh, in that respect as far as the disney dining plan everyone in the travel party receives one table service meal per night one quick service meal per night and a snack or non-alcoholic drink per night uh, in their package and one resort refillable drink mug meals and snacks can be redeemed at any time disney quick service similar except it's two quick service meals and uh yeah i i've never done this i know people that swear by it though like my sister-in-law like is bummed they're going in July and she wishes it was there because she did it last time. She went, loved it. And I guess, yeah, I, the, you know, it doesn't lock you into, into a specific time you've got to eat or a specific location. So there's like flexibility with it, which is nice. But yeah, I don't know. I've never been intrigued to try it out. But hey, I'm happy it's back for the folks who enjoyed it. Yeah, if I was going to do like a full on Disney trip, I probably um, probably would do it and maybe even do the table service one just because i haven't um been to a bunch of different table service ones i think that might be a good excuse but the one thing the downside to this is that once you have that you go back to those dining reservations being a little bit harder to come by because everyone wants to you know use their thing maybe before they would have just figured it out in the moment but now they have to plan ahead you have to get your table i'm I'm already spending the money i'm gonna get the eat at the restaurant i want to eat at so Alrighty, well, so that's coming back. And then now Walt Disney World is currently, quote, working on ways for guests to be able to plan their Disney, Genie Plus, and individual Lightning Lane selections before their park visit day. It's Fast Plus Plus, except you pay for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty much, right? So, so now remind me, Disney Genie Plus, at one point you could purchase in advance, but you couldn't book selections in advance, Correct. Correct. So now Disney Genie Plus is, you basically pay for it day of. At Walt Disney World, yes, it has to be the day of. Disneyland, you can still buy it with your ticket for the lowest price it's ever going to be, or you could take your chances on the day of, and it might be that same price or it might be higher. Okay, so that means that, at least in my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, if if Walt Disney World's trying to make ways where you can make those selections in advance, that means you're going to have to buy it in advance, right? Yeah. Okay, so the buying in advance is going to come back. That's the the idea, yes. But then they're also going to add to the selection process, which is going to just make it like Fast Pass Plus, where now you have to, you know, to make your selections 90 days in advance. And I wonder what that means for people who are buying a day of. Um, Kyle, I don't know if I've made this clear. I am not a fan of uh, Disney Genie Plus or Lightning Lane. I have heard this. Okay, I, I've said it before. 
Yeah, um, it's right after you. We should have like your your Ten Commandments and just kind of like <laughs> embed your different speeches. So you have your physical media speech, you have your Disney Genie Plus speech, uh, you have your uh, Rick Moranis speech, and you just kind of have a collection of <laughs> Rick Moranis slash Honey I Shrunk the Kids speech. <laughs> okay, um, DePauli's Ten Commandments. Let's work on it, and we'll make a T shirt, right? And we'll sell it. We'll send it to DeFranco for approval. Excellent. Some people are listening are like, who are they talking about? Phil DeFranco. Check him out. Good guy. Don't know him. Anywho. So yeah, that's happening. Uh, Before we move on, Kyle, I'd like to remind listeners that this month, May of 2023, is an Ask Me Anything live stream month for patrons of Disney Coast to Coast. The live stream is scheduled to take place the evening of Tuesday, May 30th, and I would love to see you there. To find out how you can take part, as well as discover even more bonuses, simply click on the Patreon link in this episode's description. Becoming a patron truly is the best way of supporting this podcast. So thank you to all of my current patrons and for those of you considering joining. Kyle, uh, what would you ask me at an Ask Me Anything? Um, I would ask you, what's your favorite color? Mm, The world may never know, but the patrons will. (laughs) Anyhow. I should have said, what's your favorite scary movie? Ooh. In a reference to Scream. Yeah, you probably know the answer to that question. What do you think the answer to that question is? Your favorite scary movie? Mm Mm-hmm. Is it Scream? Yeah, it is. (laughs) Scream is what made me, I always say, are you afraid of the dark is what made me like a horror fan as a kid. Scream is what made me a horror fan as an adult slash teenager. So, yep, it's Scream. I gave you that one for free. Anywho, starting January 9th, 2024, Walt Disney World guests with date-based tickets will no longer be required to make a theme park reservation. And the world huzzahed and hooray, and we're all happy to hear this news. Right, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, it seems kind of obvious. So, first when I heard this, I was like, so it's just included like it is for one-day tickets? And they're like, no, no, you just don't need one. I'm like, but it's essentially the same. Aren't we saying the same thing is if it's date-based, then why would you ever need another reservation? But the difference is you don't have to choose a park. So, date-based tickets include tickets that are purchased through Disney's website, as well as those included with Disney travel packages. Meanwhile, other admission types, such as annual passes, convention tickets, and youth groups, will still require reservations where applicable. Date-based one-day tickets, date-based multi-day tickets, and vacation package with date-based tickets are all good to go. So, once again, some more like pre-pandemic, getting back to normal sort of stuff. Took a while, still not 100%. And, but I don't know if we'll ever get to 100% with this. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, I guess, that, like I said, the park, not having to choose a park is kind of the big deal here. Otherwise, it's really not that different. <laughs> um, I guess just park reservations aren't really going away. They just aren't another step. Um, and I guess the park thing is a big deal. So that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, listen, the easier – I think they've learned. Like, attendance is down at Walt Disney World, right? Like, it's, I mean, I don't know that for certain, but like – Well, they just put out summer ticket deals with like, yeah, fifty dollar t- day tickets for uh ho- for Florida residents. $50 per day, not like $50 for one day. Yeah, I've been seeing deals kind of left and right, and um, which can only mean one thing. Attendance is down, and – I, you know, I think that the the message has finally perhaps come across that it's become not only too expensive, but like too complicated. And I think that's really the big thing, right? It's it's a very complicated process. I think there have been a lot of people who have – in fact, I know. I have a friend who was just in Orlando who wanted to go to a Disney park, couldn't get the reservation they wanted, and said, okay, I'm going to Universal today because I don't have to deal with that crap there. So – yeah. Perhaps that message was finally gotten. Not sure why it took so long, but hey, there we go. Also starting in 2024, Walt Disney World will introduce good-to-go days for annual pass holders and cast members. On these days, they'll be able to visit without the need to make a theme park reservation. Of note, good-to-go days may vary by park. Additionally, pass blockout days and capacity limitations will still apply. Once introduced, good-to-go days will continue to roll out on an ongoing basis. This policy update will be in addition to the recent changes that allows APs to visit the parks without a reservation on most afternoons. So, once again, the before times kind of. Um, it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's all great news. It's not like... It's not that exciting news, because like... <laughs> it's like one of those things when... Um, 
you know, you shouldn't get too excited about it because, like, yeah, this is just what life used what to be like. Cookie? Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 so, um, but hey, I'm happy to see it happening finally. And hopefully it makes people's vacations an easier thing. And annual pass holders getting what they deserve, right? Like, come on. Yeah. And I should say, as of the time that we're recording this, all of Walt Disney World's annual passes are still available. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> they, they said they made it sound like they were going to run out, and then they didn't. So if you want one, especially if you don't live in Florida, go go ahead and uh, get that one. <laughs> Attendance is down. All right. Well, that's the reality. That's the news. Anything you want to add, Kyle? Um, We're going to make a board of your Ten Commandments where you have stuff that you want to add. So like when I ask you that and you're and you're always surprised by the question each week, you can just pull one of these ten. And uh, well, yeah, this is this is the part of the show where I'm like, oh, yeah, what news broke today that I should probably <laughs> mention because it missed the deadline? What broke in the last 30 minutes? Well, we mentioned the ticket deals. We mentioned uh, Avatar Way of Water coming to Disney+. Plus. What else we got? Oh, Frozen. Uh, World of Frozen is opening in November in Hong Kong. BI Passholder Days are coming this June to Walt Disney World because attendance is down. And um, that's pretty much it. All righty. Excellent. Sounds good. I'll see you again in another two weeks. And hopefully it feels like two weeks and not a month the next time I see you. Yeah, I don't know if the, I think the it seeming like longer might be a good thing. So now I'm a little offended, but I'm going to go ahead and accept it. No, I don't want it to feel longer. That's bad. Okay. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well, listen, fonder of you, but the, the stuff going on in life that made it feel longer, I'd rather <laughs> not. Fair enough. All right. Way to clarify and bring everybody down. Yes, exactly. So, uh, Kyle, thanks for being here. A pleasure to see you. I'll talk to you again <laughs> you in a couple too. weeks. All right. Bye. To read more about any and all of the stories you've heard here today, simply visit the show notes link in this episode's description. You've heard the news, and now I want to hear what you have to say about it. What do you think of all of these updates when it comes to Walt Disney World vacation planning? Share your thoughts on that or any other topics mentioned in today's episode. Call 818-860-2569, and you may just hear yourself on a future episode of Disney Coast to Coast. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Don't miss any future episodes by subscribing and following Disney with a Z, Coast coast on your favorite podcast app where episodes are available 24 7 until next time anything you need can be found in this episode's description from additional information and links discussed in this episode found in the show notes contact info to reach me access to the show's official website some free gifts from me to you and so much more so be sure to check out this episode's description other than that folks have a magical day bye